addition to the other verses I have read each night, I want to add this portion of Scripture to it. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, there is an admonition here. There's instruction in verse 1. He is saying, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms. Look at this. And basically it's saying the doctrine of laying on of hands. We know nothing about that doctrine. It's a statement. But in the beginning, there was a doctrine of laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. In upstate New York, in nurses' training, when nurses go to training to become a nurse, they are taught in nurses' training that a nurse who is well who walks into the room of a patient who is ill, if the nurse will stretch forth her hand and lay it on that individual, that person becomes better. People, if they understand that in medical science, how much more should we understand the power of hands? In the Bible, hands were for healing. When you lay hands on someone and pray, there's something imparted from you. There's something transmitted from you to them. And if they know these things in medical science, we should get involved like we've never been involved before. You have nothing to lose, everything to gain. One simple touch can make a difference for eternity. I know it's only the beginning of what I have to say tonight, but with that in mind, take the hand of the person next to you and just pray or say whatever you feel to say to God just for a moment. There is that human touch. There is that something that comes from one to another. Powerful. <clears throat> wonderful and if we just stayed with this it would become more intense and more intense and more intense because there's a power in being obedient to the word of God and practicing what the Bible says now from this morning you understand that I have been involved with the theater before I came into the church, I went to the theater every week, sometimes twice a week. It was my favorite form of entertainment. So because of that, I have seen within my lifetime some of the greatest performances that human eyes could ever see or human ears could ever hear. I've watched in these performances, people have clapped, they have shouted, they've dropped purses, they've dropped handkerchiefs, they've all kinds of things that people do because of a great performance, some great bit of oratory, some great bit of acting, some great uh, uh, physical accomplishment in athletics. People just clap and shout and worship. And it is a kind of worship, actually. But it's in the wrong direction. I got to thinking one day of all the performances I had seen, once I came into this truth, I looked at Calvary totally different. Calvary is the single greatest performance that the world would ever behold. But there was no one there to applaud. There was no one there to clap. There was no one there. And I got to thinking to myself, you know what? I'll give him a standing ovation every time I come to church.
the people, that's wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful. It's powerful what I feel right now just because of a standing ovation for this man called Jesus. The devil had no idea what was happening. When he heard Jesus cry out, it is finished. I really believe the devil went to the four corners of his kingdom, pulled the forces of darkness to him, and I believe there was a celebration in that place called hell because they thought when the body of this man called Jesus slumped on that cross in death, they thought it was over. He had no idea it was just beginning. He did not have an idea what was going on because I believe that Jesus came to his personal, his spiritual person, walked into the very gates of hell, and I think he banged on the gates of hell, and the emissary posted there said, who is it? And the voice answered, I am Jesus of Nazareth. That emissary raced into the very pits of hell, into the very throne room of Satan, and said, sir, I am sorry to interrupt this celebration, but there's someone knocking at the gate. And I believe that Lucifer said, who is it? And the answer came, he says he is Jesus of Nazareth. You talk about bringing a party to a screeching halt. It came to a screeching halt. And Lucifer said, you will have to let him in. That MSA went back to the very gates of hell and opened the gates. And I believe that Jesus walked by him, turned his back on him. And Jesus walked down into that place. And I believe when Jesus walked up to Lucifer, he extended a nail-scarred hand. And he said, Lucifer, give them to me. Give them to me. The keys of death and hell, give them to me. And I believe that Lucifer reached into his garment, if he wears a garment, and dropped the keys of death and hell into a nail-scarred hand. And Jesus clasped those and walked up out of that place. But I believe that when Jesus stood at the gates of hell and looked back down into that place, this is what he said. He, Lucifer... In the future, my church will be knocking at the gates of hell, and you must open to them, for it is written, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. People, that's where we are. That's why we shout. That's why we dance. That's why we have church, because... You listen, we ought to be storming the gates of hell. You need to be storming the gates of hell. You ought to command, devil, let my mother go. Let my father go. Let my sister go. Let my brother go. Let my neighbor go. We need to storm the gates of hell because the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. It shall not prevail against the church. They shall not prevail against the church. It is written. It is written. Tap again and shout with all of your might. When I came into this in 1963, it was apostolic, but people didn't clap. They didn't. They'd lift their hands, they'd worship God, they'd cry, tremble a little, but they never really clapped like we do now in a service. Sometimes in services across the country and out of the country, they'll have people stand and clap two or three times sometimes, or be seated and clap two or three times. When I got on the evangelistic field out of Bible college, I would ask people to stand and clap. And I kept at it in all my travels. I may be the force that helped get this thing going, this clapping. And if I am, 
I am proud of myself. I'll repent later for the pride, but right now, I'm not repenting. People, we need to clap and worship God like we've never worshiped him before. People are clapping everywhere. There's a sound of clapping. There's a sound of worship all across the country. This continent, something is happening in this continent. Something's happening in Canada. There's something that's happening in Canada. Something is happening here. If you believe that, <clears throat> what would happen if every man, every woman, every young person would just clap for the Lord for a moment? Just everyone, no matter who you are, just visiting, whatever, just clap. You see what happens? Something happens when you begin to clap and to worship the Lord. Because I can worship God by myself, but if I can get you to worship with me, we will magnify him. And that's what happened just now. You magnified him. You magnified him. And I tell you, once you get the Holy Ghost coming because of worship, blind eyes can suddenly open. Deaf ears can snap open. Cancer cells can be burned out. Legs can grow. Eyes can see. Ears can hear. Worship is the prerequisite to the miraculous. Mm. If I can clap for performances in this world, I can certainly clap for Jesus and Calvary. And I do all the time. I've done it in my own home by myself. Just clapped and thanked him for every drop of blood he shed, for every painful step he took for the likes of me. There's some amazing things taking place right now. God showed this to me probably a couple of years ago. I never realized it before. I think it had happened perhaps, but I hadn't realized it as acutely, as um, detailed as I do now. <clears throat> what got me into this was when I pastored years ago, back in the 70s, I won... A lot of people to the Lord from the streets and high school students and all of that. And there was one woman I won to the Lord and her two daughters. And she became a prophetess under my particular ministry. And she was used by God. Well, one day she called me and she said, Brother Stone King, I have a friend. And of course, Nell Sawinski was her name. She was a Roman Catholic. And um, she called me and she said, I've got a friend in the hospital and she's dying with cancer. She said, would you go pray for her? I said, of course, I'll go. So I went. And when I got to the hospital there in the Schenectady area, I walked in to this room. And she was alone by herself in a private room. And she was lying there in that bed. And in my way of doing things, I walked over. But when I looked at her, I, I, I just couldn't believe what I saw because the, her arms and her neck, and she was an older woman, but her neck and her shoulders were just dark red and blue and purple. It just, it looked awful. And so I was moved and I got down on my knees beside her and I took her hands in my hands and I, I called her mother. I said, mother, what happened to you? She called me dear reverend. She said, dear reverend, she said, they put me in this room, a radiation room, and she said, they put me on this table. Uh, and she said, then there's a button on the wall. And they push this button. And when they push it, the rays, the radiation rays, are slanted through my body to burn out the cancer cells. She said, but they got the table slanted wrong. And the rays did not go through my body. They stuck in my body. And they cooked my flesh. She said, but when they pushed that button... I didn't feel anything. I prayed for her, wept with her, and God mightily touched her. But later I got to thinking, you know, we're all so much about feeling, you know. But I thought to myself, the most powerful radiation room on planet Earth is the sanctuary of a church. 
Because when you come walking through those doors, you enter into the most powerful radiation room on planet Earth. You don't have to feel anything, but the rays of the Holy Ghost can just burn through that suit, through that dress, and burn out cancer cells, cause eyes to see, ears to hear. That's what we're in here right now. You're in that. It's miraculous. And God has spoken to me for the last couple of years. I mentioned it last night, but there's a lot of worship. You may have heard me. But there were people who walked in here last night. And you're here again tonight, some of you. It's different people than were here last night. But the thing is, some of you walked in here carrying things in your body physically that would not have come to surface for another six months or a year. But because you came into the house of God and worshiped him, God took that out of your body and you'll never come down with that. You'll never come down with it. You walked in here with it. You walked out of here without it. That's why no matter what you feel or don't feel, you ought to get your hands in the air. You ought to lift your voices. You ought to clap your hands. You ought to praise God because you're probably getting a healing and don't even know it. You don't have to feel anything. The rays of the Holy Ghost are in this place. Oh. A couple of years before Brother T.W. Barnes passed away, as I said before, he was like a dad to me. He called me one day, and we were talking, and he said, he said, Brother Stone King, God's protecting you. I said, what do you mean? He said, I get phone calls here all the time from people that just sat in the audiences while you were preaching, and they were healed of cancer. He said, you never went near them. You never called them out. You never anointed them. They were just healed. He said, if it was noised abroad, all the things that are happening in your ministry, there'd be a jealousy rise against you that would make it difficult for you. He said, so God is protecting you. So at this point, I don't have to see it. I don't have to get the credit for it. I'm not the healer anyhow. I just want to feel it. I can tell that things are happening in this service. I don't need the recognition. I don't need it. And God is moving in a tremendous way. God is moving in a powerful way. All kinds of things are happening. So what I have pray I prayed today, I said, Jesus, every preacher that's been in this service that's heard me, I want you to give them the gift of faith that when they step in their pulpits, wherever they come from, that the power of God will fall and miracles and signs and wonders will begin to happen. Ladies and gentlemen, if every man of God that's been here and is here tonight gets a hold of the gift of faith and the power of God begins to move and miracles begin to happen and it gets noised abroad around and this public around you, you're not going to build a building big enough to house what's coming because people are sick, sick of religion. They're sick of it. They want something that is real. They don't want a dead Christ on a crucifix. I want to tell you the cross is empty. The tomb is empty. But my heart is it's filled with the presence and power of God. My life is filled with this resurrection power of the man called Jesus. <laughs> mm. Help me pray for a moment. I want that to happen. We've got to have revival. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to have revival. We've got to have it. It's now or never for us. And these four walls, this is eventually going to go to the streets. It's going to go to the streets. I was thinking about all this flooding that's going on in Texas and places. Churches are being absolutely wiped out. What are they going to do? They don't have a building. I'll tell you what they're going to have to do. They're going to have to go to the streets. They can worship on the streets. They can dance on the streets. They can preach on the streets. It's going to go to the streets before it's over. God may be doing some things that we don't even understand. I don't care what has to happen. I just want an earth shaking revival. I hear the sound of abundance of rain. I hear the voice, the voice of God. I can hear the crackle of cloven tongues of fire. Something is happening among us that's never happened before. So get a hold of God now. Now, now is the time. Do something now, now, not tomorrow, now, now, tonight. 
because you may never feel this again. You may never feel what you feel here tonight. Behold, today is the day of salvation. If you feel God in this service tonight, don't put it off until next service because you may never feel this way again. You need to come now because today is the day of salvation. Get in while the water is being troubled. Don't come to us at the end of the service after God has moved and the anointing has lifted and fellowship has taken over and ask us to pray for you. It's too late. You should have got in while the water was being troubled. You need to push your way through. You need to pull people out of the way. You need to get to one of them preachers here and say, get your hands on me, Brother Woodward. Get your hands on me, Brother Smith. Get your hands on me, Brother Shatwell. Get your hands on me, Brother Stokey. Because it's now, now, now. Tap again and let your voice out. There's revelation here. There's understanding. Something is happening to you. Something is happening to me. Something is happening to all of us. Years ago, this happened back in the 70s, 1970s. Years ago, I went to a place called Tulsa, Oklahoma. This church was not in UPC, but it was an apostolic church. Brother and Sister William Sr. pastored there. It's one of the greatest churches I've ever been in. It was powerful. They believed God for healing for everything. They didn't even take aspirins. They didn't. They had their own midwives. They took care of the birth of their children. They never went to doctors, period. I knew that when I went there. And of course, I believe in divine healing, and so that's not difficult for me to understand how they felt. But during the course of that meeting, one, after, one Sunday afternoon, close to church time that night, John, the son, John Williams, called me and said, Brother Stone King, We've had an accident. He said, one of the teenage girls in my church, he said, was on a stepladder in the pantry reaching for something and she fell and she broke her arm and the bone is coming through the flesh. He said, and so she's coming for prayer tonight. He said, so get here as soon as you can. So I went and I knew how they felt about God healing and no doctors involved. I'm not saying that's how you should do it. I'm just saying that's what they did. So I got there and she's seated on this front pew here. Her eyes are swollen. She's been crying. And you can see the bone coming through. And he had the people stand, about 500 of them, and they stood. And uh, he motioned her to come forward and she came forward. And we step, I stepped down two steps toward her. And all he did was, he anointed her with oil in the name of Jesus, is what he did. I didn't close my eyes. I watched. When we said in Jesus' name, that bone withdrew before our eyes and the flesh closed over and you couldn't see a cut. And the girl went, ah, and started dancing. That's how the service began, not how it ended. That's how the service began. And once you've seen it, it doesn't make any difference who scoffs it, 
who doesn't believe it, who doesn't want it, it doesn't count. It just doesn't matter. I have seen it. God is a miracle working God. I said it here. There's nothing in your body that is greater than Jesus. It does not exist. It does not exist. I don't care what the prognosis is or the diagnosis is. There's a dear and glorious physician whose name is Jesus who made a body out of clay and he can heal it just like that. If you believe that, clap or worship God in your own way because faith is rising in this place and where faith is, the miraculous. I saw it. And um, Mom and Pop Williams, they, they, they were just, they were something. They, they really, really were. But... They had a German shepherd. They had to get one because someone had broken into Mama Pop Williams' home. So they got this German shepherd to protect things. And uh, John, on Sunday morning, after service, he went uh, to the house first before the rest of us got there from church in the altar service. And because we're gonna have dinner in Mama Pop Williams' house that day after the morning service. And that German shepherd came around and uh, John Williams, he full-grown man, he just reached down and just tussled up the dog's head in his ears. Well, I found out later, German shepherds don't want you messing with their heads or their ears. I didn't know that. He didn't know it. And he just went on, walking slowly toward the door from the car. That German shepherd circled him. And when he, he made the circle, he lunged for John's throat and he missed and his fangs caught the lip here, tore it to the bone and tore it all the way around this way and down. So when we got there from church, he was at the end of the table with this white, that old white tape, but butterfly tape, and he had the flesh taped together like this all around. He didn't go to the doctor, he just sat there. He couldn't eat, so they gave him broth, and he sucked it through a straw. But I watched this. Within a week, you could not tell that the flesh had ever been torn. There was not even a scar. If we can get to the place where we have this kind of faith in God, there will be nothing that can stop us. Nothing can stop us. And the Holy Ghost is pulling at our people all across this continent to get involved with him like they've never been involved before. It may not be important to you tonight, but if you are dying with the disease, it becomes very important to you. It does. Well... I watched this. I didn't know what to do with it. I preached there for weeks. We had dozens and dozens get the Holy Works back there. People, there was a beauty queen that came all the way from Florida to that meeting. They came from California to that meeting. The news of the power of God that was there spread everywhere. They came from everywhere. It was amazing. Just amazing. But Pop Williams came down with cancer in his nose. Well, he never went to a doctor. He just prayed and trusted God. But what happened was, in the end result, the cancer ate away basically his whole nose. And there was just this ugly, raw flesh hole in, the, in his face. And they put a, 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 like a, a white square gauze pad over it and taped it. He didn't seem to have any pain. But, um, I mean... When you haven't seen things like this, you're not sure what to do with it. But at their house one day when I was there after a service, Pop Williams was over here in a, in a chair and I felt to have him pray for me. So I walked over to him and I just knelt down on my knees in front of him and I said, Pop, I want you to lay your hands on me and I want you to pray for me. Because I was just a young evangelist. I said, I want you to pray for me that God will help me and have the faith, the power that you people have here, that type of thing. 
He reached forth his hands and he just prayed as only he could pray. And I could feel God, but then I felt a hand on my back. And it was Sister Williams, Mary Williams. She was a genius, that woman was a genius. She taught Sunday school on Sunday morning. I never missed a Sunday. I never heard anyone explain the scriptures like she did. There was no one like her. So I knew I could hear her voice. She was praying for me. So when she stopped praying, I stood up. And this is what she said to me. She said, Brother Stone King, while I was praying, I had a vision of you. She said, I saw you walking on a pathway. She said, there was light on the pathway. She said, but there were stones along the path. She said, but I looked again, and in between the stones, there were flowers. It came to pass exactly as she said. I've walked on this pathway for over 50 years, and there's always been light on my pathway. There have been some stones, but there have always been flowers among those stones. You people are the flowers. You make it all worthwhile. All of it. <laughs> the Holy Ghost is speaking, is speaking to some of you now because there are similar things you can relate to. So again, don't worry about your neighbor or anyone that's around you. But just express for one moment in time what you're feeling and what you feel God will do for you. And what you feel he will do for you, he will do it tonight. That's it. Just let your voice out. There have been some mighty deliverances in this meeting. Brother Smith has led us through some mighty places in God for healing and deliverances. But tonight, there's something else here. God wants to absolutely set your brain free of pressure. I want you to just believe that for one moment in time and let your voice out and mention his name because something is sweeping across this audience. It's coming from my right. It's going across the entire audience. There's a deliverance, a sweeping deliverance that's coming across the audience right now. <laughs> Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive it and rejoice in it. O oh, my people, rejoice in it, saith the Lord. Oh. How many of you can feel something actually has just happened to you? That you really do feel it. Can you feel something has just happened to you? Mm, mm. And again, we have time for this. <laughs> Hando 
Hitala Vareka Pateko Shotoho Vraka. Jesus, I worship you because you are God. There are those that are rejoicing in what has just happened to them. So let's all of us mingle our voices with their voices and just be thankful for what God has just done because you are different and you are changed. Years ago, I pastored a man, his name was Robert Escadel. He now is 89 years of age. Brother Shatwell and I just saw him because he now lives with a daughter and uh, son-in-law in Pensacola, Florida. We were just there. When I first met him, Robert Escadel was a very unusual individual. He had grown up in Norway and during World War II, he had seen his best friends hanged by the Nazis on light poles along the city streets. I'm not sure how it happened, except, and he doesn't know, except God knows who you are, and he knows where you are, and he knows what you could do for him, and so he'll make a way for you. He'll alter things, move people out of your lives, put people in your lives that will help you get where he wants you to go. So Robert, as just a young man, he was hired by the Nazis to do office work, to janitorial work. He, they used him to just do things. Well, he wore these big bib overhauls and uh, when the Nazis that he worked for and cleaned their offices for would go out of the offices, they left their keys on the desk. And Robert carried uh, a square of wax in his pocket and the side that was near his body was warm. And when those officers walked out, he'd walk over to the keys on the desk, take that warm wax out and press it on the key and get the imprint, then turn it over so it was on the outside and put that on the outside. So what happened was the Norwegians, they had keys and to every safe, to all of the vaults of the Nazis and the Nazis had no idea how they were getting this information. That's the kind of person he was. He would go up in the Adirondack Mountains with just a knife and sleep on the ground. He was just one incredible individual. He had received the Holy Ghost. There was a great Norwegian revival many, many years ago. He had seen, seen people fall out on the streets in trances, in churches. He had seen great moves of God. I knew that. But he was, had never been baptized in Jesus' name. I gave him a lesson and I baptized him in Jesus' name. Well, <clears throat> he wasn't sure he had the Holy Ghost because his only experience with the Holy Ghost was to see fellow Norwegians fall out on the ground or the floor of a building and just lay in trances and speak with tongues. Because he hadn't fallen out, he wasn't sure he had the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I said, Robert, the Bible doesn't say fall out and lay in a trance. It says you receive the Holy Ghost speaking with tongues, sitting up, lying down, standing, whatever. In the end result, I convinced him he had the Holy Ghost. Under that, he became very gifted in the spirit, and he saw things. He was amazing. Like, for example, one Sunday morning, I'm preaching in the pulpit, okay? We have a baptistry like this in the church I was in, a window up there like that, all of that. And uh, he's over here, and while I'm preaching, he is over here, tears running down his face. I knew he was seeing something, but I didn't know what, but I kept on preaching. You know, if people are in the spirit, it doesn't really, it doesn't really upset things. 
It doesn't mess things up. It's when you walk in and out. It's when you talk and do crazy things. That disrupts the spirit. But if you're moving in the spirit, it doesn't affect the moving of God. So, right in the middle of my preaching, he gets up and walks up here, which would mess up most churches, I understand that. And I'm up here, and he's over here, <clears throat> and this is what he's doing. He's going like this, and, and I'm trying to keep my mind on my message, and he's going like this. He did that several times, just sobbing. I could hardly wait to get to the end of the service because I wanted to find out what was going on. I walked over to him. I said, Robert, what was all of this about? He said, Brother Strong King, when you stepped in the pulpit, he said, an angel of God didn't even bother to come through the baptistry opening. It came straight through the wall and was standing there. He said, I wanted to touch it. He said, but I couldn't. My hand kept going through it. I couldn't touch him. Well... If you have things like that going on in church, this becomes the most exciting thing in the entire week. You understand what I'm saying? And you get to the place where you could hardly wait to get to church to see what is about to happen. People, that's where you are here in this church. Something is happening this weekend that has never, ever happened before. Something is happening. You're in places you've never been, and you're going to go places you've never been. How many of you want to go? You just want to go. No matter how foolish you look, no matter how silly it looks to someone else no matter what criticism comes and goes you just want to get there as for me I don't care what it looks like I just want to get there I want to see it I want to touch it I want to experience it I want to get involved with apostolic procedures I want the miraculous I want signs wonders and miracles this is our heritage this is what belongs to us as a people <clears throat> mm. I was standing in Israel on the Mount of Olives looking over the Mediterranean, the uh, Sea of Galilee. And Moshe Kafre was the guide, and Raymond knows him. And there was a young man with us on my tour. He's standing over here, and uh, he's, the Holy Ghost came on us, and we were all praying. But this young man was just speaking with tongues, speaking with tongues. I noticed that Moshe Kafre, the guide, was standing on my left. He took his hat off and bowed his head. So when we stopped praying and the people began to move back toward the bus to go to the next stop, Moshe said to me, he said, he said, Reverend, where did that boy learn to speak that ancient classical Hebrew? I said, what do you mean? He said, he spoke clearly in the Hebrew language, classical Hebrew. He said, where did he learn that? I said, he doesn't know Hebrew. He said, is that that tongues thing? I said, yes, that's what it is. <laughs> I was in a service and there was a professor in the audience and he spoke different languages and there was in the service there was a person over here that stood and gave a message in tongues. And then there was someone over here that stood and said exactly what she had said in tongues in English. But this man, this professor, understood the language that this person was speaking in. So he comes up and he says, why did this person stand in this language and say this? And someone over here in English said exactly the same thing. What's that all about? You understand what I'm saying? We don't make any sense to this world. We're not supposed to make any sense to this world. It doesn't matter what this world thinks. It really doesn't matter. But we have a hold of these things right now among us. I was in this Schenectady church once while I was pastoring there. Someone else was speaking, and I chose to stand in the audience over here along the wall on this side, and that's where I was. There was a young man beside me. He was some kind of a college student. I don't know what he was. But anyway, I was speaking with tongues. Well, at the end of that particular session, he turned to me. He said, where did you learn ancient classical Latin? I said, I don't speak Latin. The end of that was he got baptized in Jesus' name and is filled with the Holy Ghost. 
I mean, people, this is what we're all about. This is what we're all about. There were people here this morning that got the Holy Ghost who had no intention of getting the Holy Ghost. They didn't come to get the Holy Ghost. They just came to see. Well, you saw and you found and you've got it. And that's how it is. I want to tell you, you folks that are sitting on the back row back there, you think you're safe back there because you're not up front. You're not safe back there at all because the gift of faith is in this house. This whole audience was an altar service this morning. The Holy Ghost is just as real back there or in that balcony as he is up front. had a 10-year-old cousin in Iowa, never been out of the county, let alone the state, and he went to uh, an Iowa district camp meeting in the summertime, and there were missionaries there from Brazil, and Brother J.T. Pugh was the preacher for that particular conference. My 10-year-old cousin came down to the altar, and God filled him with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, the Two missionaries from Brazil, they speak Portuguese in that country. And these missionaries became so excited, they were shouting. And Brother Pew came running, and he said, what's going on? And these missionaries said, this young man is speaking in Portuguese. We understand what he's saying. God filled him with the Holy Ghost, and he was speaking in Portuguese. Brother Pew said, well, can you tell me what he's saying? They said, yes. He is saying, I am being filled with a river of light. I am being filled with a river of light. I am being filled with a river of light. People, when you have the Holy Ghost, you are filled with a river of light. It's a river of light. He is the light of the world, and that light has come to live inside of you. I was uh, in a meeting with, um, years ago, I did a lot of things. I had a young man traveling with me. His name was Louis Dunnels. He now pastors in Southern Ohio. But he's, some, he's a kid that I took in that no one had any hope for. And uh, in the end result, he's pastoring now, married, got wonderful children, etc., etc. And he's a tremendous preacher. He's, he gets some great, great sermon thoughts, still does. I just talked to him the other day. But in these years, he was working with me, traveling, to help me pray people through the Holy Ghost because we were praying hundreds through to the Holy Ghost back there. And that wasn't happening just everywhere, but it was happening for me. It was happening for us. Well, we would fly back and forth between Dallas, Texas, and Houston because we preached for Brother Kershaw in Dallas and then come back and preach for Brother Kilgore. So we were doing this back and forth. Well, we did a morning for um, Brother Kil uh, Brother Kershaw, and we were flying back in the afternoon to do a service for Brother Kilgore that night. So, we were flying on a plane where you don't have reserved seats, okay? So, I said to Louis, I said, look, don't, as we board the plane, don't get separated from me. Stay close behind me so we can sit together and we can discuss what we're going to do tonight for the service. He said, okay. So, <clears throat> I, we're in line, I get on, and when I get, step on the plane, right here in the front, over here, I, I walk in, there's some guy on the, on, the, on, the outs, on the aisle here, there's an empty seat, and then I took the window seat. I turned around, somehow someone got between me and Louie, he wasn't right behind me. So he was coming, three or four people back there. So I just reached my hand over and laid it on the seat to save it for him. Mm. The guy on the aisle looked at me and said, you can't save that seat. I said, yes, I can. He said, you're not big enough. <laughs> Something hit me. I went, in the name of Jesus. I don't know where it came from. It just was there. He went like this. He sat there, ladies and gentlemen, the entire flight. When Louis got on, he said, he said, what's wrong with him? I said, don't worry about it. I'll tell you about it later. Just leave him alone. He never even looked at us when the plane landed. He got up and walked off. What I'm saying is, you don't have to put up with some of this stuff. You don't have to put up with these things, people. You don't have to put up with a bunch of nonsense. You need to fight fire with fire. You need to go after some of this stuff. You can reverse the curse. This year, this year, 
I was going through something and I realized where it was coming from. I said, Lord Jesus, I said, I want you to send that back to the individual that sent it to me and I want you to do to them what they sent it it to do to me and I said to that spirit go and that thing left and went I reversed the curse I sent the curse back where it came from that dude was in trouble and had trouble for weeks that's his problem not mine let me tell you something folks it's time we came out of the corner fighting we need to fight and stand up for what we are we need to speak it like it is <clears throat> We're not a bunch of nobodies and low lowlifes going nowhere. We have come from all different races. We have come from all different forces in this world. And we are on our way to heaven. God doesn't care what color your skin is. I don't care if you're black, black, yellow, purple, green, or white. You know, when you cut inside here, the heart is all the same color. Did you know that? Did you know that? It is. There's something about us. There's something going on in this hour. Multitudes are coming. Multitudes are coming. Multitudes are coming. I found out there's a hundred million people in the underground church in China. A hundred million people, Christians in the underground church in China, and most of them are baptized in Jesus' name. So where we're coming to church or not coming to church, God is moving in the continents. He's moving in Asia. He's moving in China. He's moving all over the world. We're a part of that. We are a part of that we are a part of all of that oh <clears throat> when I was in ABI in Bible college I taught personal evangelism on Sunday afternoon and at one point brother Norris hired me to work as a personal evangelist and contact um, presidents of banks hotels all over St. Paul and so I did that and I went, what I did was, I, after school was out and I had lunch, I would take my black attaché case, my suit and white shirt and tie, and I'd go downtown um, to these various offices. I sent a letter before I went and told them that I was coming to see them. I had something I wanted to offer to them. So I would send the letter, and then about a week later, I would go to that address, and I'd walk in. I'd say to the secretary, I'm Reverend Stone King. I have come from such and such. You've received the letter from me. I'd like to see President so-and-so. They said, well, we'll call. He will be able to see you. And I would walk into their office. It was amazing, some of the things that happened. I walked around to their desk. I greeted them. And I walked around to the desk, opened up my attache case, took out a blank piece of paper, and drew a straight line like this. I put um, Adam here, and I put a cross here, and I put an arrow up here, and I put the... Uh, a candlestick for the church age, an arrow rather, and all the way here in a white throne judgment. Uh, that was what I drew for them. And I explained it. I said, now, I said, you see the cross here? That's Jesus. Do you see the arrow here? I said, that's when he comes for his people. I said, but you see the white throne judgment here? I said, all men will stand from Adam all the way through at the white throne judgment and be judged there. You will stand there. There's a tribulation period coming, but you can escape all of it. Do you see this arrow right here? If you get baptized in Jesus, repent, get baptized in Jesus' name and fill with the Holy Ghost, you can escape all of this and you can go straight up in the rapture. It was amazing the things that happened as a result of that. I walked in this one office and the man, he was not happy to see me at all. And so I didn't mind. I walked around, gave him the whole lecture. He didn't say anything, period. I thanked him and I walked out. But when I got to the door of his office and took hold of the handle of the door, he said, Reverend, I said, yes. He said, please pray for me. My business is in trouble. <laughs> the power of God that is inside of us. But I did this personal evangelism on Sunday afternoon. There were about 50 students that would come to those classes. We'd wade the snow and go out and knock on doors and invite people to church. Then we'd come back in and get to the service on Sunday night. In one of those personal evangelism classes, there was a young man, a student. He came to me. He walked down that little aisle in that room where we were. 
He said, Brother Stone King, he said, my sister's in the hospital. My father has called. She's dying. She's got some kind of a disease and they can't help her. He said, she's in tubes and wires and she's not expected to live. My father has called and told me what's going on. He said, he said he's very worried. He said, Could I, may I stand in for her and you would pray for me as if it were her? I said, of course. That young man got down on his knees in front of me. I laid my hands on him and I prayed for him in the name of Jesus as if it were that young girl and commanded in Jesus' name. And the students were praying. They had their hands reached toward him and we worshiped God. Went out and waited the snow and did all of the canvassing we did. That night, I got to the church at 7 o'clock for the service and the students were coming in. And this young man saw me. He came running. He said, Brother Stone King, he said, I got a call from my father. Something has happened. He said, they, the nurses came in. They found my sister. She had broken the tubes and the wires. She was dancing in the spirit on the hospital room floor. And they can't figure out what's happened. She said, he, she's been totally healed. Totally healed by the presence and power of God. We checked the records. That girl jumped out of that bed at the very moment we prayed. I prayed for him in the aisle of that room. Totally, totally healed. Wonderfully healed. Oh. One of the things that has probably moved me more than anything is in second year in school, I took a child psychology course. Sister Norris taught. She was just a brilliant teacher. She had a PhD in philosophy. One of the things she did was to take us to a nursing home and there were a lot of people there that were mentally incapacitated. But she wanted us to see, as we studied humanity and the human body, etc., and the mind, what could happen. So we went. Well, I don't mind telling you, when we walked in there, my whole class, I somehow was at the end of the group. And we're just walking through, and these people were coming and pointing at us, and doing various things. But as I walked along, I came upon what looked like a huge adult baby crib on the floor. And the mattress was on the floor with this crib all around it. And I was walking by it and I happened to look in. And there was an aged old woman lying on that mattress. She was just very frail and she's very thin. And I don't know, but in my way of doing things, I just stopped and I said, isn't there something that this Jesus could do for her? And I took a hold of the railing on that crib, looked down at her and began to sing, the healer's coming down the road. He can save and he can heal. Just tell him what you need. The healer is coming down the road. When I began to sing, that old woman threw both of her hands in the air. Tears shot out of her eyes and God filled her with the baptism of the Holy Ghost lying right there in that crib. People, if you feel like doing it, do it. Doesn't make any difference what people think. If you feel like doing something, just do it miraculously, wonderfully filled with the Holy Ghost. I was in Madisonville, Kentucky recently, and um, there was a woman that came a few years ago. She was Jewish. Her son had come into the church, and uh, he had brought his mother to the services, and she was over here in a wheelchair, and the place was filled with people. It was a wonderful group. And I had preached. Well, faith was so high. The gift of faith was there that the women, some of the women, got around this woman in the wheelchair. This Jewish woman began to pray for her. They just prayed and prayed and prayed. And uh, seemingly nothing happened. And they just walked away. But all of a sudden, when they walked away, a miracle happened. This woman had had bones removed from her knees and legs. And the doctor said she'd never stand again. She'd never be able to walk again because they had removed through this surgery bones in the, in the knees and in the legs. But when those women walked away, I was watching. I never prayed for her. The, the believers prayed. She reached to the, the arms of that wheelchair, pulled herself up and stood 
which she's not supposed to be able to do. And she began to walk across the front just like this. She began to walk. She just kept walking. She got here. She made an about face. She turned around and she walked back. The, the power of God came in that place. At the end of that service, she walked out of the church, across the parking lot, down the steps, into the fellowship hall where we're eating, and went from table to table and told what God had done for her. And God had filled her with the Holy Ghost out in that wheelchair. It was amazing. It was amazing. It was just amazing. Just amazing. You've got power. You've got that kind of power. You've got that kind of power. So about a week and a half later, she went back to the doctor who had done the surgery, the knee surgery. And he, when she walked in, he said, what are you doing? She said, walking. He said, how? She said, well, I've been to this church and they pray for me and I've been healed. He said, let me take x-rays. <laughs> he took x-rays. He came back after a little while and he said, I want to know, who did the bone replacement surgery in your knees? She said, I didn't have any bone replacement surgery in my knees. He said, yes, you did. And whoever did it was a master surgeon. This happened in Brother, Kil Brother T. W. Barnes' church. You know the glory of holiness and the ways of God, which make no sense to the world. But in Brother T. W. Barnes' church, I had preached on a whole message I put together entitled The Order of Creation, which talks about uncut hair on our women and the power that they have and the position they have in the kingdom of God. Because ladies, you can do something that men can't do. But if you do what you're supposed to do according to the scriptures, then something happens in the church that cannot happen without your cooperation and your ministry. But then let's leave the women for a moment and go to the men. And you do it here and I'm so thrilled. Men, if you'd lift up holy hands in every service and begin to worship God, and you ladies would never cut your hair, we could have such a move of God like the world has never known before because it has nothing to do with me or what I think. It has to do with what the Bible says. But <clears throat> there was a woman in his church with two small children. The husband was gone. A tornado came through Minden, Louisiana, and this woman's home was right in direct line with this tornado. It was coming straight toward her home, and she couldn't escape. There was nothing that she could do. What she did was, and the wind was blowing, and it was coming. She could see it coming. What she did was she got a chair and put in the middle of that house, put her children on it, took down her long uncut hair and covered her children with her hair and began to worship God. That storm came to the house and split, went around the house and went on. Her house was never touched. Brother Barnes told me in the Texas camp meeting, he was asked to preach it a few years ago. And he said that they brought a woman to him that had polio when she was a teenager. And one whole leg, the polio had settled in that leg and there was no flesh on the leg. It was just skin wrapped around the bone. The woman now is an adult. And they brought her up on the platform in front of the whole Texas camp meeting and asked Brother Barnes to pray for her. He said, boy, it's the greatest miracle I've ever seen in my whole ministry. He said, I prayed for her in Jesus' name.
And he said, I looked down and the flesh began to grow back on that leg. He said it took 15 minutes for all the flesh to grow back on the leg. And in 15 minutes, the leg looked exactly like the other one. All the flesh had grown back. Mm. <laughs> Do that one more time. Jesus, help us to see, to believe, to claim for our very own. Was it because of the times when year? I just was walking along the platform and there were preachers coming this way and I walked by one particular preacher. He had one leg shorter than the other one. All I did was walk by him and uh, reached over and just touched him as I went by. And I went about maybe four or five, maybe 10 steps, I can't remember. But he, he yelled and he came back. He said, Brother Stone King, he said, this short leg has just grown. It's exactly the same leg, length as the other leg. He said, it's a miracle. He had to learn to walk all over again. God healed him. Do you realize what kind of power we have inside of us? Do any of us really realize what kind of power is inside of us as a believer? Say, I am a believer. Say, say I have what he's talking about. I've seen these things. I believe God can do anything, everything, all things. Nothing is impossible with God. If you can feel the Holy Ghost right now, if you can feel the Holy Ghost, that same feeling is what causes blind eyes to see. That same spirit is what causes deaf ears to open. That same spirit is what causes cancer cells to burn out of your body. That same spirit is what causes legs to grow. That same spirit is what causes tumors to disappear from your body. That same spirit is what causes you to be totally healed. It causes lungs to clear. It's the same spirit. So if you feel God right now in any measure at all, that is the healing power of Almighty God. And he is flowing all over. Over this audience. Miracles are happening and going to happen even further in this service. If you want to see more miracles like we've already seen, stand to your feet and just lift your hands. And Brother Smith is coming to take this mic, but I want you to lift your voice and let it out. That's it. Let your voice out. Something is about to happen. Something is about to happen. The anointing, the miraculous in this place. The working of miracles is in this place. And it's going to come at the hands of believers and the voice of this man of God.